Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, February 27th. Today's topic is an open mic session, incorporating games in the classroom. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Uh, Paula will be facilitating the open mic session today. And if you do want to get on the mic, remember you need to raise your hand so that we can give you the mic. You don't have the mic automatically in order to partic participate in today's show. Um, Peggy is currently at, at Camp Phoenix, which is why she's not logged in. And it seems like Tammy's having a little bit of trouble. Um, so I think. Patty, have you done the closed captioning? Can you jump in and, for the time being, help with the closed captioning? That would be appreciated until Tammy can join us again. It's hard to tell how long she's going to be out. So I'm going to now turn the mic over to Paula, who will begin our show with this question, how and why is it important to incorporate games into the classroom? Well, good morning, everyone. At least it's morning where I am. I'm normally in New Orleans, Louisiana, but today I am attending a mini LeQ conference uh, about an hour and a half uh, to the west in Baton Rouge. So I am taking time out of sessions to come be the facilitator for our open mic session today on how do we incorporate games into our classroom. So let's talk about how and why it's important. Well, first of all, it uses a different part of the child's brain. If they're getting up out of their desk and maybe getting on the floor or moving to an other, another area in the classroom to uh, play dice or play a card game or maybe they're doing tech, um, you know, so there's movement involved. Um, if it's a board game, it's uh, tactile and it's good for our tactile kinesthetic learners. And it just offers a different way to get some um, information across to our students. For those of you that don't know me, I am a fourth grade teacher. I am currently teaching ELA and social studies. Uh, this is year 40 for me in the classroom. And I absolutely love education. And I have no plans on retiring anytime soon. So one of the things that we want to do today <clears throat> is we definitely want to encourage your participation in this um, open mic session. So one of the things, oh wait, before we even do that, hold on, let me back up one second. Okay, before we do that, let's try this. It's just a thought that I had, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I created a Padlet where any time during the session today or maybe even after the session, if you have a chance to go snap a picture of your favorite game, um, you can add it to our Padlet here that I created. And I thought that would just be fun to see uh, what board games are your favorites. So I'm going to start out with this question. What is your fondest childhood memory of a board game? And you can either share in the chat room, or if you're nice and brave, you can go ahead and raise your hand, which is located over here under the participants window. It's the third icon in. And if you click on that, your uh, number will go by your board, and I'll call your name, and we'll give you mic permission. Um, access so that you can speak. So, what is your fondest childhood memory involving a board game? And while we're getting our brave people thinking about that and getting ready to raise their hand or type it in, I'm going to share mine. My brother and I were Monopoly fanatics for a couple of summers. And we had a, the Monopoly game set up in our garage on almost like a 24-7 basis. And kids would just 
you know, filter in and filter out and filter in and filter out and the Monopoly board stayed set up all summer long and it was just a fun time to see who could, you know, own the most property and, and um, bankrupt people quickly and of course my brother always seemed to be the winner but I think that's because he was the banker. No, I'm just teasing. Would anybody else like to take the mic and share or I don't see too much being typed into the chat room. Ah, Yahtzee, Maureen, that's a favorite. Scra oh, my mother and I would have Scrabble competitions. It actually helped me with my spelling. I had a, a very terrible time with, with uh, learning how to spell, so Scrabble always helped me with that. That's the one I put, uh, Carrie, that's what I put on the Padlet because Clue was one of my favorites when it came out. <clears throat> Okay. It looks like Patty might like to share. Sorry. I love who you played with. Oh, I'm sorry. Patty. There we go. Okay, Patty. I'm going to give you the mic and I'm going to get off. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. okay so um, my favorite memory is not... I had several board games that I really enjoyed, but I think the, re the thing I remember most was in elementary school, I, I had four younger sisters, and we only lived a block away from school, and at that time, everybody walked home for lunch, and we had what seemed to me a very long lunchtime. And every lunchtime, we would quick eat our lunch, and my mom would spread out whatever board game we were into at that time, and we spent the rest of our lunchtime playing a board game. And one time, a neighbor from across the street came over and said, I can't, to my mother, I can't believe you didn't let her win. And my mother said, I never let them win. I teach them how to play the game, and when they win, they do it on their own. That's one smart mama. That's awesome. That had to be so much fun, and what a great way to have spend a lunchtime. Wouldn't that be fun to do at school where our students are, can't walk home, um, like the good old days, to have an opportunity to play board games at lunchtime? I think I'm going to introduce that to my school next week. Anybody else want to take the mic? Okay, Tammy, you're up. When I was in fifth grade, every Friday we had a spelling test, but on Wednesday we would do a practice run at the spelling test. If you got a perfect score on Wednesday, you got the time that the spelling test would run off, so it might be 20 minutes or so, and then you can go to the board game area. So it was always an extra incentive to master those spelling words early so that on the actual spelling test you can have it as a fun game time. We always played Candyland, my friend and I. Very good. That's an awesome strategy also. Okay, let's move on to, I don't see anybody else raising their hand, so I'm going to move on to the next question. That was just to kind of get our, our minds thinking about some of our favorite board games. Okay, so our next question, and the slides are so slow, come on. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, do you ever host a board game day in your classroom? for school, when, why, how often? Again, please share by either typing into the chat room, or even better, since this is open mic, raise your hand and take the mic. Um, we do it as um, a PBIS, the positive behavior. Um, which I think we've done it, um, we were doing it last year um, as a once a quarter activity where the students could bring a board game and I believe it was like each teacher kind of decided when but it was usually like an hour after lunch or maybe the last hour of the day where they could play their board games. So the kids love it and it's so much fun to see what the new board games are out now. I don't have children or grandchildren so I'm not up to date on the newest board games but it's fun. So that's one way we do it is in, um, yes, we incorporate it in with our PBIS uh, reward system. Okay, 
Scrabble Friday once a month. Oh, oh I've used categories a lot with science and social studies topics. Oh, yes, I love doing that. That's fun, too. Battleship. Board games. Nope, no board games. Okay. Anybody want to raise your hand? Anybody thinking about a way that they could incorporate board games? <coughs> One of the things that I um, like doing is having the older students help some of the younger students. We've adopted a pre-K class in our school, and of course, sometimes they get a little, you know, much when they're trying to all play board games at once. So they, my big kids take a small group of them and, and play board games. Of course, one of our favorite games because it's very active, and I guess it falls into the board game category is Twister. And they love it because the little ones are not only learning the color recognition, but they're left and the right, you know. So that's always fun to play, too. Um, we definitely do that on International Dot Day. That was one of our big activities when we brought them up to our classroom. Uh, it was one of the stations where the, um, the fourth graders helped the pre-Ks play Twister, and they did it in small groups, and it was really cute to watch. And because it was dot day, of course, the circles on the twister board fit in really well with the dot theme. Okay. Um, on board games, one of the things as I was researching for this that I came up with that you might be interested in, how many of you remember the board game operation? Well, here on Instructable, it's a way for you to make your own instructable operation board game. Um, this could be part of your maker space or um, anything like that. And of course, you could tie it in with some other topics besides the human body if you wanted to. So you know, let your, cre your creative imagination carry you away with how you would use that. Yes, make it with Makey Makey. <laughs> yes, could work it into your science kits um, with the circuit makers. I thought it would be a fun thing for you know some kids to get involved in in um, doing that. And then another thing that I discovered, and I know a lot of us uh, participated in the Hour of Code, and people are always looking for non-tech ways to do Hour of Coding. So here are some um, non-tech board games that teach coding skills to your child. Now, of course, there's a little bit of cost involved with this to buy the games, but you know, it might be something that you want to think about getting into your school system, you know, asking for some donations or things like that. Okay, moving on to the next question. This is one that I really hope that some of you in the in the chat room will go ahead and answer. As soon as it comes up. Have you ever had your students create board games? And if so, for what subjects and how? Please raise your hand or share with us how you're doing this. I know that we have a, an artist in residence that comes in once uh, a year. Her name is Diane de la Casas. She is a um, fractured fairy tale book writer from our area here in Louisiana. And she, um, one year, had all of the students, I mean, she goes to every single one of our classrooms and every single grade level, because um, she spends about two weeks in our building. And she had every single group of kids make board games to go with the particular um, fractured fairy tale that they had made. Um, that they started out by doing one as a big group with Di one of Diane's books, and then she had them write fractured fairy tales based on like Little Red Riding Hood or um, um, I can't even think right now, Three Little Pigs or something like that. And then they had to make a board game that went to that. Okay, I have not on second grade. Wouldn't that be fun to do as a project? Math reviews, Eileen, that would be interesting. Love to hear more about that. Anybody want to take the mic? We have shy people today. This was just a picture I found online of one. Um, I know that there are lots of templates 
that you could um, actually print out for your students uh, as far as the path, and they could figure out where to put the, you know, the back two steps, or yeah, you did this, but move ahead two steps, and then figure out what cards or whatever they want to do it with, or the questions could be right on the game board. So there's lots of different ways that you could have students make game boards. So um, if you have any um, links that you could drop, definitely do that. I have this one here that I'll share. It gives you some more examples of student-created game boards. And then moving on with my next question. Oh, this is one that I created for my kids um, that I use with all their vocabulary. Um, I took bingo and changed it into wordo. And um, my students, they get the card. Um, they put their own vocabulary words in each uh, spot so that each Wordo card is different, and then I would normally when we started, I would be the word caller, the definition caller, and they would have to match it up on um, their board. And if they got, you know, Wordo, which would be five in a row, any direction, horizontally, vertically, or diagonally, they would call out Wordo. And back in the good old days when I first started doing this, they would all earn a little um, lollipop as their treat or. A, uh, 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 airhead or some kind of favorite hard candy. Well, since we moved away from that, now it's just you know more intrinsic. Hey, yeah, you get you got to win that round and get your name on the the Wordo Hall of Fame kind of thing. Ah, flippity online. Maureen, so we're going to have you take the mic when we get to the online part of this, so you can share more about flippity. So get ready, Maureen. We're going to have you take the mic. All right, so. What about this question? Instead of have, have you ever adapted a classic board game to use in your classroom? And if so, how? Have you thought of ways to do that? Or have you seen ways? <laughs> I know, Maureen, that's why I'm, I'm giving you plenty of notice so that you're ready. <laughs> My shy friend. We're going to get you over that. Um, I haven't actually taken a board game to do that with. The only thing I did was the bingo card. But I was when I was researching, I found that there are lots of ways to use Candyland. They are on, um, I think, Teachers Pay Teachers. And I found a couple of free ones because I'm all about free. So I know, I'm not sure which this link is, but this one, if it's here, it's the free one. Um, it's a way to add, to take the Candyland game board and you just add these little things that are um, there in the link so that you've turned that um, game, that board game into a sight word game for first graders. And I thought, what a fun way to get board games in and do it with something for your academics. Then another thing that I discovered was this one. I thought this was really interesting, too. Uh, an article about how classic games are powerful learning aids in the classroom. These are some good links that I thought would be, you know, if you hadn't thought about using games, this would be a way to do it. Um, another one that I found was how to use the top five game boards in an ESL classroom. <clears throat> to help people become um, more fluent English speakers. I love some of these people. It's, you know, I, I, I'm not as creative as I would love to be, but when I see these ideas and I borrow from other people, I think, boy, these are some great ideas. I could do this. And I know that probably a lot of us sitting in this room today feel the same way. So, you know, it's always good to borrow. Educators are into borrowing. Oops, is that time to move on? Okay, let's see. Here's another link about classroom activities and praise of old school. Yes, Pinterest has lots of good links on it. Definitely check out Pinterest. Just search for game boards or game boards in the classroom. 
Uh, another one that I found for math teachers, here is one that turns Candyland into addition and subtraction practice. So there's that for those of you that are teaching math. Patty, take the mic, please. Okay, Patty. Uh, there, there, there it is. There it is. Okay. Um, I can't say that I personally have had my students create games. I know uh, our music teacher has done it with one or two classes. A social st studies teacher has done it. But um, the comment I wanted to make was I think that the, the skills that go into actually coming up with a working board game are really important. And it's almost like when you're making a video and you have to storyboard things, I think you almost might need a flow chart or some kind of an organizer to say, what is it, like a backwards design, you know, what, what's the goal? What do we want the winner to end up with? And try to work back from there. Because I know when my kids did Hour of Code and the ones who at the end were making the Star Wars game and the Minecraft game, they really had a hard time coming up with what's the goal of this game? How do I get from point A to B? So I think there's a, a lot of learning that can go into that planning and design and, you know, a lot of strategy that has to be worked on. Yes, Patty, I, I, you are so right. And I love that idea of having them create a flow chart. One of the things that I learned um, through watching Diane Delacasas have the kids design board games is they have to understand have somewhat of an understanding of fair and unfair and just and unjust games and things like that um, you know and, and think through that process so definitely there's a lot of higher level thinking skills that go into designing board games but it would be such an awesome thing to give let kids have a try at. Um, to see what they would come up with. All right, so it says third graders have a running competition. Oh, that's neat. Okay, so the, this is something maybe they do at lunchtime or when they have um, some spare time in the classroom. Okay. All right, so let's. We've spent some time talking about board games, so now let's move over to card games. And of course, when I think of card games, I think of math. So I'm hoping that some of you very creative people in this room are going to help me figure out ways to incorporate cards into ELA or social studies instead of math. So what card games do you like to play with your kids and why and how? Anybody want to share the mic with that? Oh, everybody got quiet again. Okay. Well, I have a nice thing that I'm going to share with you here for those of you who do teach math. This was one of my go-tos when I was a math teacher. Um, it's free and online. Um, Acing Math, One Deck at a Time. It's a whole book of card games that... Um, I think it goes all the way down to the first grade. I think it's first through eighth grade levels, um, but most of them tend to be um, geared toward third, fourth, fifth graders. So if you're in those grade levels, definitely share this out with people, um, you know, helping them learn their math facts. Our favorite was, I can't even remember what it was called, but you, um, you hold a card up on your forehead and your partner holds a card up on their forehead. So when you pick the card up, you've gone straight from the desk to your forehead. So you can't see your card, but your partner can, and you can see their card. And then the third person, because you play it as a team of three, the third person says the product. So let's say that you're looking at your partner's card, and the number that you see is a three. Ah, salute, that's it, yes. And when they say salute, the, the uh, third person would call out the product 21. So you see a three, the product is 21, so what does that tell you? Your card is a seven, so whichever person can call out their number faster gets to win it. And it is so much fun, it's so cute to watch them 
salute and put their little cards up on their forehead. I love watching that game being played. <clears throat> Anybody else? Let's see. Um, another one that I have, uh, another link that I have to share with you are some, um, this one goes into dice, which we're getting into a minute. But this one is a link for dice and card games to practice your math skills. There is a fun game. Ah, a little bit like, but you, ah, okay. So it's more about words instead of numbers, I'm guessing. Sounds interesting. Okay. Hopefully, spoons. I like, I use pictures. <laughs> I love spoons. Except I always seem to get scratched when I was playing spoons because you have to watch fingernails in that session, in that those kind of games, I guess. Okay, another thing that I'd like to share, I did find one way to use dice in, in the ELA area, but it was a little bit on a lower level, but it got my brain thinking about how I could boost it up maybe a little bit higher for uh, fourth graders or even upper schools. But I found this fairy tale dice activity where um, depending on what you roll on the dice helps you determine the character, the setting, um, the uh, different people that are taking part in the fairy tale. And then you have to write the fairy tale. So you roll the dice to kind of figure out who's going to be in your fairy tale. So that was kind of interesting too. Um, another one, another one that I have that gives you some free downloadable printable materials is again a math centered one, but you know, for those of you teaching math, definitely a great resource to have. Then I found this one on math games using dice. And this is, again, just all sorts of different math games. And then one last one I'm going to share before we move into the tech part of games um, were math games for middle schools. So I thought this was interesting for the the older students, instead of keeping everything so elementary. But I, I was glad to find that one to share with some of you that teach older students or maybe older students who are not quite working up to grade level yet that need a little extra math support. I thought those would be some fun games to play. Okay, so we've spent time talking about board games, card games, and dice. Oh, and I have one tip I wanted to share about dice. I have, I don't know what it is about my personality, <laughs> but I have a really tough time with, like somebody in the beginning of the show said their favorite game was Yahtzee. Or they had a fond memory of playing Yahtzee. And one of the things that I wanted to share about that is I can't stand that noise. It just drives me crazy. So I had to find quiet dice when I was a math teacher. And one of the things that I um, discovered was that when I went to my dollar store, I could buy these very soft foam cubes. And they came in a pack of uh, 25. And I could take a Sharpie and I could draw the dots on each one of the the Sharpies, I mean on each side of the foam um, cubes, and I could make these lovely, quiet dice. And then I didn't mind playing dice games anymore in my classroom. So I wanted to share that with you, if you are like me and you cannot stand the sound of dice just you know, going all at one time. So that's my, one of my favorite tips to share with people. Um, so that it's a nice quiet game. Patty, I know, it's just, it's like somebody clicking a pen. I, I've literally um, banned clickable pens in my class because it just drives me crazy. It's just one of those things that sets my nerves on edge. Sorry, but anyhow. Okay, so now we're going to move into, we've talked about um, board games, dice games, card games. Now let's go into online and tech games. So let me switch this slide. 
and hopefully we're going to get you on the mic because remember this is participatory. I'm not supposed to be doing all the talking. Okay, I'm sorry. Dice games, was, I think we've already covered that. Let me move on a little bit more. Okay, slide come on. There you go. Okay, so what online or technology-based games do you use in your classroom? All right, so there we go. Thank you, Lori. The mic is yours, I think. Wait, no, I, I have the mic. Thanks, Paula. You got it? Okay. Uh, yes, online games. I'm an online math teacher, so online games work the best. Uh, I, was, I found out about Dragon Box. I'll type it in the chat. It's all one word. And it was designed as an app for practicing algebra skills. And they have two different levels. Um, one is for early elementary, and the other is for, it goes up to about age eight and then up to, to age 12 in their title. But I've used it with high school students especially in the beginning of the year when some of their algebra skills may not be up to what they need for the course. And that most of the students that have played it have loved it. Um, Dragon Box is available, at least the last time I looked at their site, as a PC version, but it's predominantly an app. But it's not free. But it's not too expensive for a, for a program. Okay, well that's a new one to me, so I'm definitely going to be adding that to my list of games. Yes, I've seen a lot of different people talking about different things, and I'm going to call on my dear friend Maureen. Come on, Maureen. You don't have to be on long. Just put your hand up so we can get you on the mic for just a little bit to talk to us about some of your favorite online games. Yay, there you go. Okay, you know how much I love being on the mic. Um, my kids love lots and lots of different games, and I have, uh, I'll have i put the symbol link in there. I like games that you can actually collect the data from, so um, I'll put some links in in a second. I can't do links and talk at the same time. But Zumbinis, I put in the, in the chat, is back. And that used to be one of my favorite games to play with kids. It's a great math game. And it's so many other pieces of it. It's back as an app. And it's also online on the Steam platform. It's a great logical thinking app. I love to play um, Kahoot with kids, make up our own quizzes. Quizlet is another one that's like that. And oh, let me think. What's the one that I wanted? I can't think of it offhand. A little pressure here, Paula. I will think of it, and I will put it back in for you, and along with some links. But there's so many games right now that are online that are just basically math blasters on steroids, especially on, on online and on apps. They don't do much other than make kids do things really quickly. And if that's your goal, fine. But if you want kids to actually learn something and retain it, you have to look at games that are adaptive. So that's all my little soapbox on that one. Back to you, Paula. Thank, thank you so much, Maureen. Yeah, I'm going to give you a gold star for today. Peggy would be so proud. Yay. We got you on the mic. <laughs> OK. so. Um, boy, I'll tell you what, Peggy's going to have fun grabbing all these links of, uh, that are flying by now. Um, Kahoot's been mentioned. Oh, I, just, I just ordered my, um, did Mama, I, I just ordered my clickers from Amazon because they are already made and laminated with a, a what do they call that, a low uh, gloss thing so they work better so that I can't wait to use clickers. I'm so excited to try that. Uh, Kahoot is one of my favorite things. I dropped that in there. And there's a new one, a new um, quiz game out called Quiz, 
that is similar to Kahoot, but it's all inclusive, like because on Kahoot, which we're going to play a Kahoot game in a little bit, you have to have one um, machine where that is hosting the game and then others join the game, whereas um, quizzes can actually be um, done with all within one um, device. So you have the the questions and the ability to answer on your device so you're not having to look at a whiteboard or whatever to play the game. So anyhow, what we are going to do, I'm hoping this works properly, um, Maureen doesn't like taking the mic and I don't like doing application sharing, but I'm going to go out of my comfort zone today and we're going to try this. Okay, so what what we need to do in order for you to be prepared, if you have never played Kahoot, you're going to want probably your phone, your smartphone out so that you can join our Kahoot game that I'm going to bring up. Or um, if you can split your screen so that you can have two screens going on your um, your laptop at the same time, you can do it that way. But what you need to do is you need to type into your um, search bar, your Omni bar if you're on Chrome, you're going to be going to Kahoot.it in a minute and um, it's going to be asking you for a PIN number and I will be sharing that with you in just a second. Hold on, let me make sure I'm set up the right way. Okay, I think I have this. Okay, here we go. Ah, uh, here we go. Let's see. Okay, everybody seeing it? Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch the Kahoot game. It's going to load in and bring up the PIN number. So you oh, 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 oh. sorry, I turned off the sound so that it doesn't overwhelm us. You enter the and then for your nickname you can do your real name or you can do a nickname or whatever makes you happy. Okay, awesome. I'll give us about another minute to let everybody have a chance to get in that wants to participate. Awesome. Yay, I'm so good. Hey, at least it's participatory on this part. Very good. Okay, are we ready? I'm going to start with our first question. Okay, and we are doing Flavors of Oreo cookies today. Here we go. Okay, so what is that a picture of? You have to select on your device the one that you think answers that question. On the left, you see the timer counting down. On the right, you see the number of people that have answered. And we're still waiting for a couple of answers. Somebody's going to get timed out here in a second. All right, so congratulations to those of you that got it right. And what it does is it shows the leaderboard on the next page. Yay, Patty's in the lead for right now. All right, our next question on Kahoot is, which flavor of Oreo is being pictured now? I did this um, Kahoot. I found this one. I did not create it. And I played this with students um, in several different states at one time after we did the Oreo stacking project, which is part of Jen Wagner's projects by Jen. She runs it in late September and October. 
and we did this as a wrap-up activity. And I didn't know there were so many different flavors of Oreo cookies. Okay, next question. Which Oreo flavor is being pictured now? You can set the timer on Kahoot questions from uh, anywhere to like three minutes down to I think 10 seconds. So you need to, um, when you're making designing your own, think about how much time you want to allow. If everyone answers the question that's in the game before the timer runs up, it just stops and gives the correct answer and then the results. I pulled one up the other day and did, never looked at the time, and it was three minutes per question, but it was on something my kids were reviewing, so they were all answering it within like a 20-second time frame. And it was just, and then I could move on to the next question. Okay, who now, I've played this game and I still forget what this one is. Oh, I think I remember now, okay. Okay, and after this, we're gonna play one more question after this and then we'll, I'll stop the game. No, oh, I'm so glad to see now everybody in the room was like me. I don't know what these flavors were. <laughs> okay, Kate underscore rock, go for it. And this will be our last question. There are more. There are actually 15 different varieties of Oreo cookies, but we're not going to play the whole game. I just wanted to give you a taste. For those of you who maybe never seen Kahoot in action. And to also let you know that you do not have to play a whole Kahoot game. It could be a great sponge activity. Pull one up and play it for the last couple of minutes before you have to go to lunch or um, before you're called down to an all school assembly. Because what you can do is you can, instead of clicking on next, you can now choose to end the quiz. Okay, we did not play the entire quiz. We're running out of time. So I'm going to stop the quiz. And I have Kate underscore rock was our winner at this point. I can click on feedback and results. You can tell me whether you liked the game or didn't. Da 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 da. It's up to you if you would like to do that. My kids do like uh, giving feedback. They especially like giving feedback on the ones that, the, that were student created. I will actually log into the computer under my Kahoot account and have them make a Kahoot game for me. So it ends up in my stuff and then that way I can kind of help them with any editing that might need to be done also. Okay, and then I can go do my final results and see, you know, who's where. And um, if you don't know, you can play it again in ghost mode, which allows you to see if you can better your results from the last time. And if you click on Save Results, you can save it to Google Drive as a Google spreadsheet, and you can actually use it for formative assessments if it happened to be a Kahoot on something that you were playing in or, um, reviewing in your classroom. All right, now, I did it. Yay, I'm so excited. Now let me see if I can stop it. Okay, hold on one second. Oh, okay, somebody did it for me. Yay, thank you, Tammy. I bet that was you. Okay, so we have gone through our open mic format. Would anyone like to take the mic to share some tech online game that they just they just need to get on the mic and share with everybody. Any takers? If not, I will probably go ahead. Let's see. I think that was everything I was supposed to cover. Okay, yes. looks like, okay. Looks like we have <laughs> Maureen <laughs> and Patty that do. All right. So it looks like I'm at that point in time. We're a little bit ahead of ourselves, but that's okay because it wasn't as participatory as I would have liked, but that happens sometimes. 
So, Lori, were there any questions that you captured as Wait, we were going along? We have along? Maureen and Patty that Maureen, want to share. Yes, Maureen has her hand up as well as Patty. So let them share out. I think I only Maureen, captured Maureen, I'm one sorry, question. your hand's up again. You want to talk? I'm not going to talk, but I will. Um, what I wanted to share was I put it in the chat was Tiny Tap is what I couldn't remember. And this is an amazing app. And it's also online to make I'm the game. I'm not hearing you, Marina. Did you push talk? I did. Can you hear me now? Actually, I can hear you, Patty. It might be Paula that's having trouble hearing because she couldn't hear when the hand raise went up. It might be Paula. Paula, oh. can you hear? Can you hear me, Tammy? Okay. Well, I'll just talk for a second then. Um, Tiny Tap is what I want to talk about, and it's pretty wonderful. You can find games there that are already made, or you can make your own, and you can also collect data, which I really like. And the other thing I wanted to ask Paula to spend a minute talking about was Breakout EDU, because I ordered it, and I'm really interested in learning more about it. Thank you. I am so sorry I missed that. My sound wasn't working. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know if you all can hear me or not. My sound seems to be messed up. So I'm going to turn it over to Lori. I know she wanted me to talk about, can you hear me? Okay, great. I will talk about Breakout EDU. I apologize. That was left off my notes, and I will uh, talk about it. Breakout EDU came from escape rooms. Um, escape rooms are where um, you go with a group of your adult friends and you are locked into a room for well, anywhere from half an hour to an hour. You have to work through a set of clues and um, figure out how to get yourself unlocked from the room. Well, some educators were thinking, boy, wouldn't that be great to do with kids? The only problem is we can't lock kids, our students, in a classroom. So they came up with another way of doing this. And what they do is they use the breakout box, breakout EDU box, which you can order offline um, for $99. Or you can go to their um, web link through Amazon, and you can buy all the pieces parts and get your own box, and it runs you about $79 to do it that way. So what happens with this is it's a mixture of tech and puzzles and word games and any way that you want to design your game format. And then the box is locked with either a number. It can be locked with several locks with the hasp. Um, you can have a number lock, you can have a word lock on it, you can have an old-fashioned key lock, um, and they have to open the locks before they can break into the breakout box. And if you have never been able to actually go to a breakout EDU game, I've done several at EdCamp, so I'm going to help facilitate some today here at the uh, Mini LeQ conference I'm at. It is awesome. And if you don't know about it, just Google Breakout EDU. They have an awesome Facebook group. They have um, games that are being created. It was kind of with the uh, older kids in mind, but the elementary teachers were like, no, we want to do this too. So there are several um, teachers who have jumped in and have created some awesome breakout EDU games for the younger students. They are math-based. They are ELA-based. They are just uh, computer-savvy based. There's lots of different ways to play them. Um, it is so great for building um, collaboration, teamwork, cooperation, um, seeing how different brains work. I love facilitating the games and just watching. Um, you can play it with a whole classroom. Normally, the ones I've done with adults, there's about seven people in a group, you know, from five to seven, eight, nine, ten. And it's interesting to watch how they will flow together, flow apart. Some people go off by themselves and want to 
think about the clue they just received. Um, some people jump in with both feet and are just like tearing the room apart looking for clues. Um, there's always a little scenario um, given. And let's see, I'm doing the very happy to you face. Maybe I'll get to you. Let's see. Yes, it is uh, Marine, definitely. I would, I would not be surprised if someone at that ed camp does not bring an EDU box. If you can't get an EDU box, I mean a breakout EDU box right now, you could always just get a box. You could put a lock on and go to the website and just kind of wing it just to give people the experience. But it is a new hot topic in education. It is a blast to do. A lot of people are doing it in faculty meetings at the beginning of the year to uh, build some team spirit on their faculties, um, using it at professional development retreats throughout the year to get the um, adults up and moving and you know, using your brain. They have, I just learned this last week, they have a new part, <coughs> pardon me, they're doing breakout homework. So I don't know much more about it other than they're really hard to figure out. It's a little video that plays and you're given clues throughout the whole video and at the end it'll say where am I or something like that and you have to figure out the clues. A friend of mine, it took him seven hours to figure out the clues. So it's pretty intense. All right, I am going to get off the mic and let Lori do her thing. So don't forget, Google Breakout EDU, get on their website, look at the games, join the Facebook community, and start having fun. Thank you so much, everyone, for today. I've enjoyed it. Hopefully, you've gained some new information from it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paula. Uh, before I take the now one question that was asked that I managed to capture, um, Patty had her hand up and wanted to get on the mic. Patty, you still have the mic privilege. Uh, do you still want to do that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Lori. I, I took my hand down because I thought we were out of time. but. I just um, actually wanted to mention two things. Um, first of all, going back to board games, um, one of the things that I think we're so involved with tech, um, we forget about having kids go back and learn the classics and the traditional things that can still teach them so much. It doesn't have to be tech related. And um, that is personal to me right now because my grandson came in yesterday and said, uh, Nana, I want to play chess. But he had no idea how to play chess. But I have a chess board. And we set it up. And I played two videos to show you know, the setup and the, the, just some basics. And he's trying to focus. He's only six. But um, this morning, I found this awesome uh, game, chess game online, which teaches kids. It comes with two storybooks. And um, it's, it's called Once Upon a Time. And I'll just um, paste that in here. The $34.99 edition is the deluxe edition. But they have special um, the pieces. The chess pieces actually match the story characters in the book. There's also a cheaper one for $19.99. And I think it's the kind of thing that would really appeal to younger kids. And if you think of all the thinking skills, that are involved with uh, chess, it would be amazing. And the only other thing I wanted to share here was uh, just a link to an image. And this is, um, I don't know if you know about flow theory and the idea of getting uh, kids and how, how involved they're going to be in an activity. And if you look at that diagram, it has the chart that shows if the skill level is low and the the challenge level is low, you've got apathy. But if the skill level is high and the challenge level is high, um, then you know you have a whole different uh, ball game there. So um, if you can get high level and high skill, you're you're in that flow. So that's it's just an, a good thing to think of when we think about bringing games in for kids. Um, you know. Where are they skill-wise? Where are they interest-wise? And you know, how can we get them more involved? So that's all I wanted to share. Thanks. Thanks, Patty. And thanks so much, everybody, 
for participating and thanks to Paula for doing the facilitating today. There was one question and it, this went back to uh, student created games. Those of you who have had students create games, what directions do you give them or what guidelines do you give them? And we might not have any answers for that. OK, that's a good idea. Make sure that chance is really random so everyone gets the opportunity to play the game. Don't get too elaborate with the game first. Limit the options to begin with. So they get they get comfortable with the game first. Yeah, the questions and answers must be from content that they've learned. That's a good idea too if they're doing a review game. All excellent suggestions. Oh, yeah, eighth grade book projects. Yeah, that might be tough for a, a board game that they create. Yeah, I would think so too. Um, likely I'd start with something a little easier than entire books. Because um, I think that would be a challenge to begin. Maybe Spin Mama game the, the Flow of the game follows the plot of the book. That could be it. Characters are the players. Something similar to Monopoly. That could work, especially for eighth grade. Yeah, maybe better in literature circles. Mm hmm. Yeah, start with the end in mind. What do you want the winner to have accomplished? Yeah, multiple kids read the same book and work together. These are all good ideas. Okay, that was that was the question I captured. There was another one that was answered in the chat, and that was about um, grades for Tiny Tap. Okay, we'll wrap up the show. So these are the upcoming shows on Saturdays on March 5th. Eric Kurtz will be here with awesome uses for Google Drawings in your classroom. March 12th, Brad Spirison, Participate Learning. And March 26th, Jordan Pedraza and Teacher Panel with Remind.com updates. This is the Learning Revolution Project, Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered together all of his PD resources at one place, including host your own webinar. You can host your own Blackboard Collaborate room, and as long as your session is public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher with this form or the tab in the live binder. Usually each month we have a featured teacher. When you exit the session, the survey should pop open in your browser. It's also in the live binder. It likely won't be in the chat box today. When you complete the survey at the bottom, you can ask for a professional development certificate, which will print out with your name. Make sure the email address you request this uh, is for the a personal email account rather than a school email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. The video collection and audio collection is in iTunes U, as well as uh, 
well, maybe not an RSS feed. <laughs> that looks like it's blocked out. But the recording is now on the the full recording. The full Illuminate recordings are in the Classroom 2.0 Live website. Special thanks again to Paula Noggle for facilitating, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform and everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.